Hey guys, today I'm bringing you one of those special distillation episodes. And today I'm doing a distillation on Michael Jordan. Yep, I'm breaking down one of the greatest basketball players and athletes of all times, mindsets, behaviors, routines, different things that he's done and apply those lessons to our own life. What, how can we do that? And so I'm going to try to extract out the ones that I thought were incredibly important and valuable and then talk them through and, and bring some highlights from some other people as well. What Got You There is a podcast for high achievers looking to learn from the most successful people of all time, what their strategies, lessons, and routines are that made them successful. Now it's your journey, so it's time to learn what's going to get you there. Um, I, I've been obsessed with MJ for a number of years. Uh, watching him on, on the Bulls when when I was really young and then just understanding more about his competitive drive, his nature, uh, it fascinated me. Uh, like Jordan, I went to the University of North Carolina, so I have that connection as well where I really just like studying him and understanding more. So this distillation, if you're listening or watching the video, you can also find it at the website, whatgotyouthere.com, and it's actually the written longer format. And they're way more extensive than what I go into here. Um, and that way you can pull some of your favorite quotes and stuff like that. And also on the website, we have past distillations we've done as well on people like uh, Jordan's former coach, Phil Jackson. Also people like Bruce Lee, former Disney CEO, Bob Iger, uh, people like Nick Konis, Josh Waitskin, the legendary chess prodigy and martial artist. So a, lo a lot of different people. And what I do is I just try to deconstruct their thinking. And so that's what we're going to do here. And I'll dive into this now. So I want to start with the title of Michael's autobiography, and that's Driven from Within. Yes, Jordan realized the importance of this. And he knew that and he made it the title of his book. And I also think it's one of the most important things not being driven from other people, not being driven by coaches or the outside world, but driven from within. It is the only sustainable fuel source there is. Jordan's drive came from within. And every one of all, the all-time greats shared this insatiable inner drive, and that propelled them to excellence. They had this deep burning desire within themselves to bring out their greatest potential and do what only they could do. Now, this distillation is going to pull back the curtain of the mind behind the most competitive person that I've come across, and that's Jordan. And I'm going to start here with a quote by Jordan. It's, I couldn't have imagined everything that has happened, but dreams are like that. That's what makes the journey so interesting. Put all the work in and then let the future emerge. It's what I did on basketball court. I let the game come to me before I imposed my will. That's a lot different than forcing the issue because you are worried about an outcome that hasn't been determined yet. Anything can happen if you are willing to put in the work and remain open to the possibility. Dreams are realized by effort, determination, passion, and staying connected to that sense of who you are. And then he says, why me? Why not me? I freaking love that, right? Like, why not me? And it makes me think of this great Steve Jobs quote. And it's, this is what Jobs said. And he said, life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact. And that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it. You can influence it. You can build your own things that other people can use. Just like Jobs, Jordan realized, why not me? There's all these other people who've done extraordinary things. Why not me? And just that openness, that possibility to let the future emerge. I love, I thought this was just so important to highlight here, um, to see that, that all of these great people uh, that we study and deconstruct, they had that question, why not me? And so another thing that Jordan highlighted is all I knew is that I never wanted to be average. Whatever I was going to do, I wanted to do it my way. I wanted the freedom to express myself. It wasn't trying to be different for the sake of being different. I just wanted to follow what I felt. And then he says, my father put a challenge in front of me. I knew what he expected, but I expected even more. The expectations I had for myself were beyond my father's expectations. My thoughts were way beyond the idea of preparing myself for a job so I could be like the guy down the street. Boom, that burning desire to go against the grain and be different is embedded in greatness. Makes me think of some of the, the people I love this study. I'll bring up a few quotes here. The first is from Arnold Schwarzenegger, and it's hitting on the same theme. It's, with my desire and my drive, I definitely wasn't normal. Normal people can be happy with a regular life. I was different. 
I felt there was more to life than just plotting through an average existence. That's the Terminator, baby. And then similar to this, uh, I, I covered this in the distillation of Bruce Lee. And he said, I feel I have this great creative and spiritual force within me that is greater than faith, greater than ambition, greater than confidence, greater than determination, greater than vision. It is all these combined. My brain becomes magnetized with this dominating force, which I hold in my hand. Boom. It's like this inner deep conviction and belief. Also makes me think of Winston Churchill, who said, I felt as, as if I were walking with destiny and that all my life had been put, it had been but a preparation for this hour and for this trial. Everything that we're experiencing, he's, he feels that it helped him get to where he is, but he realized that he's capable of greatness too. And then for someone else, I, I like that. Let's do Jay-Z, right? There's no way to quantify all this on a spreadsheet, but it's the dream of being the exception. Everyone, every single one of them, even Maya Angelou, if you're always trying to be normal, you will never know how amazing you can be. Every single person who's tapped into greatness, what do they say? You've got to be different. You've got to embrace your unique self. It's necessary. So think about that in your own life. Are you trying to follow someone else or are you being you? It's the best thing you can possibly do. And Jordan said, I had dreams. They were my dreams and I had no fear of them. I knew I wasn't going against the grain a fair amount of the time, I, or I knew I was going against the grain a fair amount of the time, but I came to realize that was just part of the process. I know my parents worried about me amounting to anything, much less someone whose dreams extended beyond Wilmington, North Carolina. That's where he grew up. But he says, but I wanted to become more than a slightly better version of somebody else. I wanted to apply my creativity to everything I did. I wanted others to see me as I saw myself. And then he says, fear of failure? Why would I have any? I didn't know where my dreams would lead. I had dreams, but I didn't have all the pictures because they didn't exist. So I could push ahead with my eyes wide open, take in whatever happened and move on. I wasn't limited by someone else's view of how my dreams should look. Boom. Talk about internally driven. I just absolutely love that line. Remember all this you can find on the website, whatgotyouthere.com. And you can pull these quotes because I think these are exceptional. And then Jordan goes on to say, he says, I don't believe in following. And he says, and the process for me has always been pure. It's been about leading and staying true, authentic to those fundamental values that flowed downstream from my parents and later coach Dean Smith. He was the head coach at University of North Carolina. And then he says, players who practice hard when no one is paying attention generally play well when everyone is watching. Success at any level can be reverse engineered to reveal the same architecture. There are no shortcuts. I have always believed in leading with action, not words. And I learned very early to follow my instincts. My standards have always been mine alone. I have never tried to be like somebody else or live up to the expectation of others. I don't believe in following. Boom, once again, going against the grain. So are you remaining true to yourself? Or are you following the other's expectations? right? For your internal happiness. This, this makes me think of Warren Buffett and to use his language, are you using an internal scorecard or an external scorecard? And long-term happiness can only be found by having an internal scorecard. You, you are the one who dictates your dreams and your happiness. And then he says, authenticity is about being true to who you are, even when everyone else wants you to be someone else. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to play fair or conduct yourself in a respectful manner, but it's a lot harder to become the best you can when you're focused on trying to be the best version of someone else. There's nothing authentic in that. And if that's not authentic, then it's not going to last. It makes me think of Naval Ravikant's great line, escape competition through authenticity. No one can beat you at being you. Boom. Once again, authenticity, being true to yourself. Look how important this foundational concept is. And he says, I've never been worried about anyone's perception one way or another. I've never allowed anyone's opinion to define me. I'm comfortable with who I am. I trust myself. And I'll talk about this later, but that's earned trust, right? You trust yourself because you've earned that trust. He put it in the work every single day and, and we'll cover that. And nothing of value comes without being earned, right? Thinking about that, that earned trust within yourself. And that's why great leaders are those who lead by example first. You can't demand respect because of a title or position and expect people to follow. That might work for a little while, but in the long run, people respond to what they see. They might even listen, but they will usually act based on the actions people are taking. And Jordan practiced ridiculously hard every single day. 
He never took days off. He expected more out of himself than anyone else. He even said when he got to the, uh, the Olympics, part of the dream team, he was actually blown away by the lack of work ethic he saw from the best players in the world. Their work ethic wasn't close to his. And he said that he quotes his, uh, his high school coach, Clifton Pop Herring. And he used to say these words, it's hard, but it's fair. And then Jordan says, I live by those words. It's hard, but it's fair. No one ever said life was going to be easy, right? Uh, I get confused why everyone expects this to always be an easy path. It's like life is really challenging. And Jordan knows that. But if you're willing to put in the work, you can uncover what's on that up the other side of that pain, of that suffering, of that challenge. And it's just so apparent how different he wanted to be. Um, and where he got a lot of this was he got it from his parents, right? And, and Jordan's mom said, more than anything, we tried to stress to Michael to enjoy what he was doing. Have a passion for what you are doing and work hard. If you don't enjoy what you are doing, then before long, you're going to be tired and you won't find stability. If you have a passion, then you are going to be challenged every day to give your best. Like I said in the beginning of this, it's the only sustainable fuel source, internal drive. You have to have a passion, a desire, a love for it. Look at anyone who's the best at what they do. There is an internal drive, an internal love. Um, this is just so important because he had that uh, belief and that if he pursued something that he loved, like Joseph Campbell's Follow Your Bliss, that it would eventually pay off. And we're constantly looking for the immediate rewards right now, right? Like society as a whole, believe me, I'm, I'm guilty of this as well. And we forget about like how long this should take, right? To touch excellence or greatness. This takes decades. But he had this passion and he knew if he put in the work every day, it could lead to amazing things. You need self-belief, you need focus, and you need passion. Three critical ingredients for success in life. I think, I think about someone like Elon Musk. He said something like, when something is important enough, you will do it, even if the odds are not in your favor. And then I think of the great restaurateur, Danny Meyer. There's nothing I'd rather be doing, he says, about owning restaurants. I was born to go into business for myself, and I was destined to find a business that would allow me to share with others my enthusiasm for things I find pleasurable. Let's hit on another all-time great basketball player, Kobe. And he says, the trick is finding what you love to do. We talk all the time about hard work. If you got to get up every morning and remind yourself how hard you have to work, you probably need to choose a different profession. That shouldn't be there. I wake up in the morning excited to get to do it. If I'm not training, I'm missing it. There is no place I'd rather be. If you have that feeling, then you are doing what you were put on this earth to do. I, I find it kind of interesting. So many people are so afraid to go after what they truly, deeply love and they're really passionate about. And instead, they do something that other people or, or the expectations others have, they, they go after that instead. And what ends up happening, right? They're miserable, they're burned out, they're frustrated. So my question is, why would you not just pursue what you love instead and find happiness and have that internal drive? I'm, I'm constantly curious about that. So if you're someone who's questioning that, I don't know. We're studying all these people. We're having all these conversations on the podcast and in the distillery. And what comes up again and again, they have a passion for what they love and they go all in on it. Drive needs to come from within and only you can know what that is. And so Jordan goes on to say, I wanted the freedom to do what I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it my way. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm the exact same. I knew from a young age, I, I just was not great at doing things others said. Um, so I, I read this and it just makes me smile. And he says, to this day, I don't enjoy working. I enjoy playing. This is a really big concept. So please listen up. He says, I enjoy playing and figuring out how to connect playing with business. To me, that's my niche. People talk about my work ethic as a player, but they don't understand what appeared to be hard work to others was simply playing for me. We were playing a game. Why not play as hard as you can? There's no pressure in taking that approach. Play to win. What else would you play? Once again, Naval Ravikant, another great line, he says, what feels like play to you, but work for others. When you know this, you're on to your passion and your purpose. Like for me, right? Like who's going to sit here, write 10,000 words studying Michael Jordan and writing it? Like I do this in my free time. I love this. This truly is my passion. I love reading these books. I love sitting down with high achievers and, and people that we can learn from. This is my passion. I truly love doing this. Makes me think of a recent guest, Adam Robinson. He says, the playful state is a powerful state. Everything Jordan does is from this state. 
If he's not excited about it, meaning play, then he doesn't do it. But Jordan believes so much in this concept. He even says that my niche is my ability to tie play into everything. You have one of the greatest basketball players. So one of the greatest athletes, one of the greatest businessmen, potentially, last 50 years, saying that his niche is he turns his work into play. That, that might be a concept we want to think about a bit more. It also makes me think of a, a great book, Running and Being by Dr. George Sheen. He says, if you are doing something you would do for nothing, then you are on your way to salvation. And if you could drop it in a minute and forget the outcome, you are even further along. And if, while you are doing it, you are transported into another existence. There is no need for you to worry about the future. What he means by that last line is, if you enter one of those flow states where time escapes you, you are so raptured in the experience, then you do not need to worry about your future because what you're doing is coming from a pure place of love. And that's something that's really important. And I hope everyone pauses, reflects on this for a second to understand the importance of that. So let's dive into, uh, into Jordan's high school and kind of understand more about his playing days. Need a little a sip of water here. So Coach Herring was his, uh, his first coach. And he says something that I just found endlessly fascinating. He says, Coach Herring was the first one to see in me what I saw in myself. A critical component for someone's success that is rarely talked about is having a mentor or someone you admire show their belief in you and provide you additional confidence. Jordan had this self-belief, but it crystallized even further when his high school coach affirmed what Jordan knew, but he knew it was like so deep inside of him. And then this got reaffirmed. Now, I, I've just seen this again and again, uh, the power of singular comment in someone's life, especially early in their life, and how that can really change their trajectory forever both positive and negative, actually. Um, you had a negative comment from someone you respect. It, it might have you quitting or stopping or questioning yourself, but the positive. Now, I, I always tell people the, the best advice I ever received was from my seventh grade lacrosse coach, Bob Turco. And he said to me, he says, the only person who can stop Sean Delaney is Sean Delaney. Now, I could literally spend days unpacking this line, but it meant so much to me because it gave me even deeper inner belief because one of the people I most respected in the world showed their belief in me. Um, so if you're in a position of power or mentorship, then don't be afraid to open your mouth and let someone know or someone that, that you see doing something that you respect, you admire, let them know. Let them know that what they're doing is helpful. It's important. I just think that's so crucial and so key. And so what he would actually do with Coach Herring is they'd get up before school um, and he'd pick up Jordan at his house at 630. And Jordan said, mornings, uh, the morning workouts before school, they were brutal. He says, most days I enjoyed it. Some days I didn't feel like going, but those were the days Coach Herring would push me. He'd pick me up at 630. We'd shoot jump shots, play one-on-one -on -one, and work on ball handling drills because I couldn't handle the ball at all. Look at this. You have this the, the burning desire, right? Getting up before school relentlessly practicing the fundamentals, not occasionally, not when you feel like it, but every damn day. That's what the greats do. They do not show up occasionally, okay? You think you're going to be great at what you do, showing up a couple times a week. You are bullshitting yourself, relentlessly practicing the fundamentals every day. And it's what all the greats do. They practice all these things and then everyone just sees the highlight reels and then they go and practice the highlight reels. I saw this again and again when I was playing lacrosse and then coaching lacrosse. You, you'd see these amazing behind the back shots or even in basketball, some trick shots, some dunk. And so the kids would go out and that's all they would practice. Do you understand the reason they were able to execute that shot is because they relentlessly practice the fundamentals first and they built a foundation that could contain all the other skills and tricks and talents they wanted to possess on top of that. That is so important. It's like what Josh Waitzkin says. He says, you're trying to learn a principle over a technique. Most people are always just looking for the technique. Give me the technique. No, you want to underlie, you want to learn the underlying principles, practice those because a principle can contain a thousand different techniques. And a line he said that I just like, Jordan said, just watch me. That was my mentality, meaning he was going to put in the work. He was going to show you his hunger. And so now we're going to dive into the element that I, I just call building confidence. And what Jordan says is most of what I did growing up was born out of a desire to be the best player in Wilmington, Wilmington, North Carolina, or be the best player in the park that day. Let's just pause for a second. 
he was just trying to be the best where he was at, right? His, his locale, right where he was at right then. He says, I didn't even have any sense of being the best player in the world or playing in the NBA because I didn't have any idea what it took. I didn't even know what it looked like. And it's a remarkable, right? Like focus on being the best in your current situation. You keep doing that and you'll keep leveling up again and again. And believe me, that, that's your best. Not, that's not other people's best. If you're playing your best and it leads you to being the best on the court that day, then that's awesome. But it's got to be your best. And he said, but I had no doubts or fears because I, ne I never had expectations that were out of context with my skill level. My expectations were very low. I wanted to be the best player at the park in Wilmington. I wanted to be better than my brothers or the other guys in the neighborhood. These were my expectations. Look at that. I, I love that part where he says, um, I never had expectations that were out of context with my skill level. I'm sure this will come up again and again, but that's earned confidence essentially, or not, not expect, not, not saying I'm going to do the most remarkable thing, but you haven't done the work to be able to do that. If you haven't done the work to be able to do that, then it, it's just, it's just false. It's false bravado. You just won't be able to do that. And so I, I love how Jordan hits on that. And with each progression, he says, I gained confidence. That's why I called the section gaining confidence. He gained confidence on the court uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina, and then in his high school, and then across the state, and then across the country, and then in the NBA. It goes on and on again. Your expectations must, must match your skill level. I mean, of course, you can dream bigger, but if you aren't putting in the work and have unrealistic expectations built on a weak foundation, then you'll never achieve your goals. They're just not going to happen. I mean, once people reach a level of greatness, like a, like a Jordan, Kobe, LeBron, it's easy to think they have this level of confidence from day one, but that confidence got built over years. It makes me think of the, uh, the legendary free solo climber. That's uh, Alex Honnold. He climbs without a rope. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, you should check out the documentary. Oh, I'm going to go blank on it right now. Um, but Google Alex Honnold, his documentary will come up where he free solos El Cap, the 3000 foot rock face. And he, uh, he had this quote, and it was something along the lines of, I spent 25 years conditioning myself uh, in extreme conditions. So he says, my brain is different. It showed up in an F MRI machine that it didn't, it didn't register certain fear sections. And he says, I've been doing this for 25 years. I built this up, but I didn't start scaling El Capitan, the 3,000-foot rock face, on day one. No, I scaled this little 10-foot wall, and then a 12, and then a 14, and then it goes on and on, right? Building confidence. It's a progression. With each progression, I gain confidence. So let's talk a little bit more about the rise, right? Like, where did he come from? How did, how did he come? And he says, I literally came out of nowhere. No one knew I existed. And so we mentioned him before. His basketball coach, Coach Herring, he brought Jordan to a five-star basketball camp in Philadelphia between his junior and senior year. So that's like the top basketball camp in the country. You can picture all the, uh, the kids who are going to be going to college in a year or two. This, the best ones were there. And prior to this, Jordan was on no one's list. And I mean, no one's list. No one knew about this kid from North Carolina, this skinny guy from North Carolina. So Jordan goes for week one and ends up dominating, dominating the week where the, the camp director calls Jordan parents. And he says, no, you're not picking him up. He has to stay for week number two. He has to. And then he even, and then Jordan's parents, uh, they were not wealthy at all. And they said, we don't have the money. And he says, I will, I will let Jordan go for free. And his mom says, no, he ends up washing dishes to pay for the second week. Uh, but I think that gives you context into how dominant he was that this, the director wanted him at this camp. Um, and one of the interesting things I read um, when he was at the camp is Jordan says, I became a sponge. I got a glimpse of what success looked like. I saw where I fit with the best players in the country and they were all there. And then he names people like Chris Mullen, Patrick Ewing, um, and then he says, that's when my parents started to believe that this kid could amount to something, man, I became a sponge, right? Like I hit it on this again and again, some of the le legendary entrepreneurs and investors, they are voracious learners. So are the best athletes, anyone at the top of their game are voracious learners. They are all sponges. Give me as much knowledge as humanly possible. And I'm going to absorb it. Bruce Lee, absorb what is useful uh, and get rid of what is useless. Right. And so it's so important know that look at this he is so hungry to understand and learn and he's one of the best in the world now we're gonna talk about proving people wrong and uh, i thought this part was interesting a and he said a lot of kids today need reinforcement they need a pat on the back back in those days if you didn't get the pat you better pat yourself and keep moving at least that's the way it was for me and that knowledge helped me understand some things i told myself that whatever i did in life 
it was going to be done my way. I knew I had to abide by the basic rules. I knew right from wrong, but I wanted to be different. Um, and, and what he's talking about here is after he did so well at this basketball camp, everyone in his, in his town was basically telling him to go to the, the Air Force Academy. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. But Jordan said, I got higher dreams than that. I'm going to North Carolina. Hell yeah, let's go Teals. <laughs> but he says, I'm going to a place no one else from my town has ever gone. You can say whatever you want, but I'm going. If I have to sit on the bench, at least I'm going to learn how to sit on the bench with the best, right? Going against the grain, saying, nope, I'm going to that school, even if everyone else is doubting me. Um, one teacher even said to him, you'll be back here in Wilmington pumping gas if you don't go to Air Force Academy. And Jordan goes, yeah, we'll see about that. I wanted to prove what I could do. Man, there were so many doubters pushing him again and again, just trying to push him down. And what does he do? Boom, proves them wrong. He puts in the work and proves them wrong. And then he gets to the University of North Carolina, and he was coached by one of the greatest basketball coaches of all time, Coach Dean Smith. And he says, Coach Dean Smith's system was about excelling at one phase of the game, or wasn't about excel excelling at one phase of the game. He was about excellence in every phase of the game. Ooh, sounds very similar to Walt Disney CEO, um, who we did a distillery on, Bob Iger. And he learned from his mentor, Rune All Allridge, and also the great sushi chef, uh, Jiro, from the documentary, Jiro Dreams of Sushi. And his, his philosophy is, you need an endless pursuit of perfection. You're constantly striving for perfection. If you want to read about that, you can check out the, uh, the Bob Iger distillation, which I highly recommend. He's one of my favorite CEOs or public market CEOs of all time. I think that distillation uh, that I did on him is loaded with incredible insights for entrepreneurs, leaders, managers. Uh, it doesn't matter. The, the lessons you can you can pull from Iger are incredible. So check that out. What got you there dot com. Uh, just click on the distillery. And then he said, Coach Smith, back to Coach Smith, his head coach at North Carolina. Coach Smith would challenge you mentally. He made you think. He never cursed at anybody. He was the perfect guy for me. He kept me humble, but he challenged me. He gave me confidence by giving me some compliments when he thought I needed them. But I was totally afraid of Coach Smith. And one of the things that Coach Smith taught him, right? We were talking about excellence in every little thing. He says, I focus on little things. Little things add up to the big things. That's how you dunk from the free throw line in the NBA All-Star uh, slam dunk competition. You work on the little things first. And those little things over time get built up and become big things. Um, it, I'm just thinking about uh, Coach Smith's practice. And Jordan said every minute was thought out. It, if a drill was supposed to end at 310, it ended at 310, and the next one started. It makes me think of Bill Walsh. I just did a, a book recap on Bill Walsh, the legendary 49er coach. His book, The Score Takes Care of Itself. You can see that at there.com underneath. It should just be book recaps. Um, and Bill Walsh did the same exact thing. He, if, if, if a receiver was running a 12-yard out, it was not 11 yards. It was not 11 and a half. It was not 12 and a half. It was 12 yards out. Bill Walsh's first day in the office of the 49ers, what he did is he wrote a memo training the secretaries how to properly answer the phone. The score takes care of itself when you work, work on the little things and relentlessly focus on those daily. Uh, I just love that. And so he's just competing. He's learning. He's absorbing. He's trying to become coachable, coachable. Jordan had the humility to learn. He's a sponge trying to learn everything he possibly can. Like Bruce Lee, he had a beginner's mind. He also was a competitor, working hard every single day. Greatness doesn't take days off. Makes me think of Michael Phelps. Uh, for, he, he was just in, in the airport when I was flying the other day. Uh, that's, that's why I'm thinking about this. And he said from for five years, from 1998 to 2003, he said, we did not believe in days off. And he said he had one day off, five years, one day off because of snowstorm. Oh my gosh. Christmas, he's in the gym. Thanksgiving, he's in the gym. Birthdays, he is in the gym or I guess the pool for Phelps every single day for five years. That's what it takes. So if you want greatness, are you willing to do that? If not, you got to choose something different. And now let's kind of talk about some of his time at the, the Chicago Bulls. And he says, I came to the Chicago Bulls with no expectations, none. The only pressure I felt when I went to the NBA was I had to prove that, or I had, I deserved to play at that level. And that was easy because it was a step-by-step -step process. Once again, the little things, right? Playing hard every day in practice, playing against veteran teammates, making the start of five, starting five, then playing against the NBA players in games. No one knew what I was capable of scoring, and no one tried to define me by putting a number on those expectations. No one had in mind 
what would be acceptable for me. After the first year, those expectations came. This is the key part. But by that time, I had positive habits. I had built a foundation for my game, so it wasn't a surprise to me. I understood that the reason I was getting attention was because of the work I had put in up to that point, not because of what I had done to meet other people's expectations for me, right? You put in the work, then the results come. The results don't come, and then you put in the work. Don't get this backwards. If you're getting this backwards, flip your model. Your model is flawed. And to Jordan, it always gets back to work and internal drive. You can't fake it. You can't achieve this level of success without building your foundation of positive habits. Um, I, I found it interesting as well, um, just kind of talking about Jordan here. Um, one of the people he played was Rod, Rod Higgins. And he Rod, Rod said, Jordan's practice habits were unmatched. I don't think he ever had the mindset of feeling his way through. Whoever was in front of him, Michael was trying to beat that guy. It didn't matter who it was. He was always trying to take it to the next level. Um, I, I just thought that gives you a, a good idea. And then someone else, uh, this, this is Jordan's best friend and his longtime personal assistant, George Kohler. And he says, um, have, you, have you ever seen Star Wars? Yoda, right? He's the Jedi master. He's the guy who taught everybody. Everybody went to Yoda for knowledge. Um, when you sit around talking to any older person who has lived their life to the fullest, they have great stories to tell because they had great experiences. He says, Michael is Yoda. He's always been an old soul. I'm still amazed at him, just like everyone else. And I've seen the entire show. Listen to that last line. I'm still amazed at him, just like everyone else. And I've seen the entire show. George has been behind the scenes with Jordan for his entire adult life. He's seen it all. And he says, I am still amazed by him, right? Like you, you go to a David Copperfield uh, magical performance. And if you were to be able to see behind the scenes, it'd be like, oh, well, that really wasn't that impressive. This guy is saying, nope, I've seen behind the scenes. And yep, I am still amazed like everybody else. I think that says a lot. That's, that says a hell of a lot. It makes me think of leading by example. And what Jordan says is my leadership came from action, all action. I was doing it with effort and work. I wasn't asking for anything from anyone. My practice habits were great, great. I forced those other guys to improve their practice habits. I challenged them. Boom. His practice habits were great. You, you want great results. You want perfect results. You need great practice. You need perfect practice. It, it's just so crucial. Um, it, Jordan was always so hard on himself and he always set the example. It was an example that would raise the standards of everyone else. And Jordan goes on to say, he says, you have to be uncompromised in your level of commitment to whatever you are doing, or it can disappear as fast as it appeared. He says, some players noticed me because of everything I was doing off the court. And that was the wrong reason to pay attention to me, pay attention to the way I played the game, pay attention to my passion, pay attention to the idea of focusing on improvement every day. Pay attention to my commitment. Commitment cannot be compromised by rewards. Excellence isn't a one week or one year D ideal. It's constant. There will be days when you don't feel on top of your game or meetings in which you aren't at your best, but your commitment remains constant. No compromises. Are you remaining uncompromised? Are you showing up like that every single day? Like you said, in the meetings. If not, hmm. You need to look at your process. And Jordan says he's uncompromised the process. And he says, my sense of commitment extended beyond the game of basketball. Um, and he says the Jordan the brand actually grew because he was uncompromised. And he says, it's easy to go the other way, right? Like rest on your laurels, get fat on your success. And he says, I don't ever want to get fat that way. And so Jordan actually had a, a motorcycle team. This was in uh, early 2005. And I guess they won the championship. And so they celebrated that night. And the next day, he, he sent out a memo basically telling them, hey, I, I want you to know to be proud of your accomplishment, but it's time to look forward. I, I think about some of the, the Super Bowl football coaches, right? You or Nick Saban um, at Alabama holding up the trophy and they're back to work the next day. They're on, they're on the trail. And one of the, the, the cool things to hear Jordan talk about is people he respects. And he mentions actually Tiger Woods. And he says the morning after Tiger Woods rallied to beat Phil Nicholson at the Ford Championship in 2005, he was in the gym by 6.30 the workout. No lights, no camera, no glitz or glamour, uncompromised. That level of commitment is what makes people great. 
And he said, work so hard. So when you get the gifts, they are yours. Uh, it makes me think of Derek Sivers, um, beautiful author. He's got a, a great book, How to Live. I, I have a full recap online, but in it, he has a line on mastery that I love. And it's, mastery is the best goal because the rich can't buy it. The imp impatient can't rush it. The privileged can't inherit it. And nobody can steal it. You can only earn it through hard work. Mastery is the ultimate status. That is one of my favorite lines of all time, because if you want to achieve mastery in anything, it is all on you. Boom, Derek Sivers, beautiful work there. And we talk about this, this drive, it once again, gets back to his parents. And this is a quote from Michael's mom. And she said, it was all about learning that there were choices and responsibilities now, how are you going to make those choices? Are you going to stand in the corner waiting for somebody to give you something? Or are you going to earn it and deserve it so no one can say you took anything without earning it? Damn, right? Like you've got your mom saying this. All right, everything in this in this life is going to be earned. That That's quite a motto to be working on, off of. I, I love the line. It's entitled or um, earn everything entitled to nothing. Um, I, I think that's great. Great philosophy. And another thing that I found really interesting when studying Jordan is he actually got some decision-making advice from Warren Buffett. And so he says, I asked Buffett about his decision-making pro uh, process. And Mr. Buffett um, basically ended up saying, he says, or when Jordan said, what's your thought process when you're making a decision? What do, you, what do you think about? And Buffett says, not much. Whatever my gut tells me, that's what I do. Whatever my gut tells me, that's what I do. I thought that was pretty wild, this is Jordan, because up to that point, no decision I had made had involved a lot of statistical analysis or a lot of weighing of the pros and cons. I was just asking myself, what do you feel? I just felt good hearing that from a guy like him. And then Jordan says, once I made a decision, I didn't think about it again. It was strictly off gut. And then he says, that's how I made a decision to go with David Falk. That's how I evaluated deals before I signed contracts. If I thought the money was cool, great. I didn't think about it again from that point. I'm bringing this up because studying multiple people throughout different generations who went on gut instinct, um, it's just one of those themes that comes up again and again. So Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart, he says uh, around decision-making, it's generally my gut that makes the final decision. If it feels right, I tend to go for it. And if it doesn't, I back off. Once again, we'll quote Danny Meyer, the great restaurateur. I had learned to trust my own instincts and to make them explicit for others. Let's hit on Steve Jobs. Have the courage to follow your heart and, and intuition. They somehow already know what you truly want to become. Everything else is secondary. Let's hit on Richard Branson, one of my favorite uh, entrepreneurs. I rely far more on gut instinct than researching huge amounts of statistics. What about Oprah? I've trusted the still small voice of intuition my entire life. And the only time I've made mistakes is when I don't listen. Sorry, my dog is uh, is laying next to me and she's dreaming. Uh, so she's making some noise. Back to Jordan here, okay? Relentless focus. All right, Sean, can you focus on the podcast right now or the dog having a dream making noise? Relentless focus. And Jordan says, I'm very secure in my ability to focus on what I want. If I have an agenda or a goal, no one is going to deter me from what I want to do. When I'm trying to make a statement or prove something, I might joke around with you, but don't confuse that with changing my motivation. Boom, focus. And then I, uh, I'm going to hit on some things. Tim Grover, that was Michael's longtime trainer, what he says. And he says, if one thing separated Michael from every other player, it was his stunning ability to block out everything and everyone else. Nothing got to him. He was ice. I've never seen another player from such a per form, such a perfect boundary around himself where nothing goes in except what he brings in. Boom. How amazing is that? His ability to focus, to, to only concentrate on what's most important. It makes me think of uh, uh, Napoleon, the great leader. And what he used to do is people said his mind was like a filing cabinet. Um, when, when he had a battle, he could be writing a love letter one moment and then right into battle the next moment. Um, I just thought that, that his compartmentalization was just so crucial. And then Grover goes on to say, Michael stayed in the zone 100% of the time from the moment he left his home or hotel room for the game until the moment he returned late that night. But during that time on the court, he was the real and authentic Michael. Boom. And then he even says, time is external. It dictates what you can and can't get done. Focus comes from inside you. 
where no one else can control it. It's so true, right? Like you control your focus, no one else. I don't care how many instant messages you're getting or notifications or distraction. You make conscious awareness to focus on those things. You can direct that focus somewhere else. The greats know how to do that. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about that focus. Let, like, let's think about that focus accompanied by effort. And the, the, what I mean by that is Jordan says, I played in front of 8,000 people a night in the beginning. So basically a small crowd, especially for the NBA. And he says that never determined how hard I played. It's easy when 18,000 people show up and every game is sold out. It's not hard to find your motivation in that environment. I was playing when the stadium was half empty and my effort was exactly the same, right? Like, are you going to show up with the same driving force, passion, um, and, and energy that you will, like it's game seven in the NBA championship on like a regular game in February. And that's, what's crucial. Jordan did that again and again and again. I'm just so impressed by that. Um, one of the things that actually was really, really impactful for me in, in my life and, and playing sports, specifically lacrosse, is, is I, I've read this or heard this from Jordan. Gosh, now this would be 20, 25 years ago, um, where he said he, he had this idea. Um, it was it, the idea that somebody might be sitting there who had never seen Michael Jordan play. I thought about that person who had never experienced the excitement or entertainment I could provide. That would be the thought that drove me to play that game. My, oh my gosh, the reason that's so important to me is this is literally what I thought about every single time I stepped out on an athletic field. And then I try and continue this mindset or I do bring this mindset to everything I do today. There's going to be someone listening to this podcast or watching me play that has never experienced me before. And when they walk away from that, what are they going to walk away saying? Is it going to change them for the positive or not? Because there's always going to be someone watching who hasn't come in contact with you before. And what impression are you going to leave? That, that just got ingrained in my head early. Uh, I, I needed to, to bring that out. So it's basically give your best and all the other things will come. Jordan did that again and again and again. So I know a little bit earlier, I touched on the Olympics, which was called the Dream Team. This was the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. And it, Jordan says, one of the best times of my life. And he says, you're talking about the greatest players in the world. Uh, all coming together, um, all, all the greats, all of the greats were there at that time. And the reason Jordan wanted to go, I mean, Jordan had been playing so, so many playoff games, things like that, but Jordan wanted to show up and he wanted to see how hard they worked, um, what the work ethic was like, how much better were these guys in practice, where were they great on game day? Um, and I, I talk a lot more about this on the, the online version of the distillery. I'm not going to get into the details too much here. Um, so if you want to remember what got you there.com, just click on the distillery. And it, some of the, the, the smack talking stories are hilarious um, that, he, that he brings up around Magic and, and Larry Bird and such. Uh, but check that out. Just, just know that he showed up to that because he wanted to know and understand just how good and what the practice habits were like uh, of the people um, that he respected a ton. And one of the things I, I highlighted because I thought it was so important, I love ingrained mentalities that are really beneficial uh, at an early age. Think about family, life, and, and home. And he says, you could never say, I can't around our family. And how can you know you can't? Go try it. That was a slogan for us. If you try, then you can't fail. You have failed if you don't try. You only have one life. Don't allow someone else to live that life for you. I love that. I, I try to do this, or my, my wife and I, we do this with our son. Um, I mean, he says, I can't do something. We, we, we prod him, we question. I mean, he's, he's going to be four soon, but we really make him question that assumption. And then all of a sudden he tries something and he realizes he can do it. And that self-belief gets built up over time, over time, over time. It's incredible. I was doing this with him a few weeks ago in the pool and he wanted to jump in off the, into the deep end off. We have a, a ledge out there and he said he can't. And then guess what? He did it. And now he absolutely loves it. And so it's showing these little things, these little wins again and again. I just thought that was really cool. Uh, I like hearing stories about different um, family environments and what's done at the dinner table that really impacts people in the long run. So I'm not going to get too much into this, but Jordan does lead the game of basketball. He heads to baseball. And one of the things I thought was, was interesting, um, I'm not sure who uh, this was, who said this, but he remembers going down to the White Sox facility in Chicago. And what he would see is Jordan taking these sheets of paper 
um, newspapers and he would just grab them and start crinkling them up in his hands. I guess this works a lot on your forearm strength. Um, you ball it up in one hand and throw it. And he says, I saw hundreds of these. I watched him do that for hours getting ready to play baseball. And he says the way he got himself ready to play baseball was absolutely grueling. So I guess in baseball, you do these things called flips, where I guess someone just tosses the ball up lightly and you hit it just to swing the bat. And he says he would do that for an hour to 90 minutes. Then the team would show up and Michael would go through the regular practice, which ran about three hours. Then he would talk to the media for a few minutes before going back out for another half hour to an hour taking more flips. If you haven't swung a baseball bat in a while and decided to pick one up and swing it for 15 minutes, your hand would have blisters. He goes, his hands were so raw from taking flips that the calluses would rip open every day. When he came off the field, I don't know how he could have held anything, much less a bat. The trainers would put a clear rubberized patch over the inside of his hands. They would um, wrap his hands in gauze and tape. He looked like a prize fighter. The next morning, Michael was back in the cage swinging a baseball bat for hours, and he never missed a day. Not only did he not miss a day, but he never said a word about his hands. The trainers knew because they were the ones patching them up every day, but Michael never said a thing. He knew what it took to be great. He's used to putting in that work. So he was expecting things like this to happen, right? Like you see this when people are starting a, a new workout routine, they're sore and they're like, oh, I'm not going to show up the next day. I'm too sore. It's like, are you kidding me? That doesn't work. You need to keep showing up again and again and again. It's just so crucial. And I love hearing the story. Um, and Jordan a big thing about that, I think you can kind of see is, is his mind, right? Like he knew the importance of the mind. And he says, the mind will play tricks on you. The mind was telling you that you couldn't go any further. The mind was telling you how much it hurt. The mind was telling you to do these things to keep you from reaching your goal. But you have to see past that. Turn it all off if you're going to get where you want to. Man. So basically, Jordan is saying, yes, the mind is going to play these tricks. So knowing that the mind plays tricks on Jordan as well, but he overcomes the tricks. He overcomes the mind games and, and someone I, I've got a lot of respect for um, who, whose book, The Mindful Athlete, I did a book recap on it's on the website was George Mumford and George Mumford worked with Jordan. Um, he basically transformed his on court leadership for the Bulls. And he also helped Kobe Bryant, uh, a ton of other NBA players. And he really worked on um, the five superpowers of the mindful athlete. That's mindfulness, concentration, insight, right effort, and trust. And so he, he thinks that Mumford had a great deal to do with his mind control. Um, and Jordan also said, I visualized where I wanted to be, what kind of player I wanted to become. I knew exactly where I wanted to go, and I focused on getting there again and again. Visualization, picturing in your mind what you're going after, playing it like a movie, getting so crystal clear on that that your subconscious doesn't know if it happened or not. That's so crucial. Visualize it again and again. Embody it like an actual experience. It's got to be emotional. You need to tie in all five senses. We're going to wrap up here just in a few minutes, but one of the things that Jordan touches on is around fear. And he says, no fear. There was never any fear for me. No fear of failure. If I miss a shot, so what? So a lot of people are like, oh, he's just being brash. He's being arrogant. Listen to this next part. Maybe even a shot that could have won a game. I can deal with that. If I don't miss the shot, then I don't miss it. We win. I can rationalize, rationalize the fact that there were only two outcomes. You either make it or you miss it. I could think that way because I knew I had earned the opportunity to take that shot. I had put in all the work, not only in that particular game, but in practice every day. If I missed, then it wasn't meant to be that simple. It wasn't because the effort wasn't there. It wasn't because I couldn't make the shot because I had taken the same shot many times in every situation. As soon as the ball went up, there weren't any nerves because I trained myself for that situation. I was as prepared as I could possibly have been for that moment. I couldn't go back and practice a little harder. I knew I had done the right things to prepare myself for that situation. One way or another, I knew I was prepared to be successful. Now, if you know you haven't prepared correctly or you know you haven't worked hard enough, that's when other thoughts and emotions creep into your mind. That's stress. That's fear. It's the same process for doing anything. Anywhere in life, no matter how big or small the stage, whether it's running a corporation, taking a test in second grade, or taking a shot to win a game, 
at that moment, you are the sum total of all the work you put in, nothing more and nothing less. If you are confident you have done everything possible to prepare yourself, then there is nothing to fear. There's no stress in losing under those circumstances. It just wasn't meant to be. See, that's a lot different than having fear and anxiety because you haven't put in the work. Once again, Jordan put in the work. So what he's saying is I put in every ounce of work. I was not regretting my practice routine. I knew I'd put in the work. And because of that, there wasn't fear. Okay. I like that. I think that's pretty damn awesome. He says, I just want to allow whatever is going to happen at its own rhythm. And one of the questions or things that Jordan says when he wakes up in the morning, he says, I would wake up in the morning thinking, okay, how am I going to attack today? So for you, your own life, how are you attacking today? How are you going to wake up tomorrow? How are you going to attack tomorrow? Are you going to wake up and do tomorrow? Or are you going to wake up and attack tomorrow? I think that's a key distinction. The greats attack it. They are hunting. They are in a relentless pursuit of what they're going after. So we're going to round this distillation of Michael Jordan out with this. And he says, in all honesty, I don't know what's ahead. If you ask me what I'm going to do in five years, I can't tell you. But he says, this moment. Now, that's a different story. I know what I'm doing moment to moment, but I have no idea what's ahead. I'm so connected to this moment that I don't make assumptions about what might come next because I don't want to lose touch with the present. Once you make assumptions about something that might happen or might not happen, then you open the, the possibility of mistakes. You start limiting the potential outcomes. I don't make assumptions. I know what I know, and I deal with my life based on what's happening right now. Damn. Talk about like seriously and mindful, right? Like being in that present moment, it's obvious that uh, he worked with Mumford and some uh, some Zen Buddhism. Speaking of that, like I mentioned, I have the George Mumford's book, The Mindful Athlete, um, linked up. And also the distillation of Phil Jackson, who did a lot of mindfulness with the Chicago Bulls and then also the Los Angeles Lakers. And I also did a book recap on Phil Jackson's book, 11 Rings. Remember, all of this and more, you can find out at whatgotyouthere.com. Uh, we also have the, the video or audio, depending on how you're consuming this, along with the written format. It's available at whatgotyouthere.com. Just click on the distillery. You can click on Michael Jordan and then see this full distillery and also check out all the previous ones that we've done in the past. Um, there, there really is just a, a treasure trove of information there um, online. I'm, I'm really proud of the amount of work um, that has gone into this for five plus years now. People ask me, like, what are some of my favorite books? And I'm believing I'm reading constantly. I love books. But what I actually end up doing the most, and this is being 100% truthful, is I go and I read my book recaps and I read my collected thoughts and learnings and distillations. I read them again and again and again, um, kind of like Jordan taking his reps every single day. And that's how I ingrain these ideas in my head. That's how I learn them. And so just to go through our list of the distillery, I had the, mo the most recent one besides Jordan, the distillation of Tony Robbins. Um, then I did the distillation of Phil Jackson, Jordan's former coach. I did the distillation of Bob Iger, Disney CEO, the distillation of Bruce Lee. Oh, I love that one. I, I truly do. I think Bruce was a philosopher who was so ahead of his time. He was not just a martial artist or an act actor. Uh, the distillation of Josh Waitzkin, uh, the chess prodigy, a true polymath or renaissance man, many talents, uh, martial arts, multiple domains, uh, distillation of Yen Liao, um, a, a great mentor of mine, an investor, the distillation of NASA astronaut, former Navy SEAL, and Harvard medical doctor Johnny Kim, also did the great um, CEO of Talk and co-owner of the Alinea Group, which owned the best restaurant in the world, Nick Akonis, the distillation of Toto Wolf, the CEO of uh, Mercedes Patronus, the, the F1 team, just an incredible leader. So I know that was a lot there, but what I'm saying is the resources, they're all there for you guys. Um, so if you want to learn more, you want to practice your reps, get your excellence in, then head to whatgotyouthere.com. You guys can check it all out. And please, 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 if you found value in this, if you enjoyed this, if you liked listening, if you've ever found any of this content valuable, the best thing you can do, honestly, I'm asking this from the bottom of my heart, share this. Send this to one person or one of the things that you found valuable. Let them know what you found val valuable. Keep sharing, creating positive ripples in the world and making an impact. I appreciate you guys listening. Once again, it is a pleasure and an honor to share this with you. Thanks again. I can't wait for you to experience another What Got You There episode. 